this is a Patreon supported show. Yay, playing with the fourth wall. So you remember a bunch of weeks ago in the credits I thanked an anonymous backer for their Patreon support? Yeah. Well, they contacted me after the fact and we worked out a show topic idea and honestly this is something I never would have thought to do on my own. So I'm very grateful that it was actually a suggestion. It was pointed out when we started this that this could be a multi-video topic, because there's a lot of layers we could look at. Mass media, internet, conferences, old media, history, but not to mention we could look at individual games and dissect how they advertise themselves, but I was specifically requested to look at various commercials and describe what works and what doesn't work. So before we begin, let's put a couple, a couple of refreshers up here. If you're not a longtime viewer, I did an episode about branding a while ago, and this episode's going to be using stuff from there without going into it too deeply here. Check the cards in the upper right-hand corner to watch that and then come back here. It's cool. The reason I don't want to rehash that whole video is, well, it's rehashing a whole video. But I will be talking a little bit about advertising history because it's, I find that fascinating. But to kind of explain where I'm going here, we got to go a little bit off topic. But first of all, and you, you can actually help me out at home here. How would you describe a can of Coke to somebody who's never tasted a soda before in their lives? Well, it's fizzy. It's uh, it's kind of a, maybe got a sweet taste. Um, it's got that cola flavor. Actually, if you've never tasted cola before, that doesn't really help. Yeah, it's not that easy to describe what a can of Coke tastes like. And advertisers know this. Why do you think most Coke ads aren't trying to sell the flavor of the drink? They show bears playing in the snow or people hanging out with friends. It's about associating drinking of a Coca-Cola with a feeling. This is branding. We covered that in the other video. It's easier to sell the feeling of a Coke or a cute polar bear rather than trying to sell the flavor of a Coke. So they don't even try. Well, well there are notable exceptions. Diet Coke compares itself to normal Coke. Pepsi ran a years-long campaign called the Pepsi Challenge, where people took sips of Pepsi and sips of Coke, and they said they preferred Pepsi in the sip test. This led in part to the new Coke disaster of the 80s, but that's a longer, more involved story that I'm hardly qualified to tell. But for the most part, soda companies sell a feeling or an idea, not the actual soda. If you want a great example of this, OK Soda. It's from the 90s, and seriously, this was a product from Coca-Cola that most of the commercials never even said what the stuff was supposed to taste like. But the commercials are targeting these jaded Gen Xers, and it came off as being well, what we'd now call a try-hard. Incidentally, OK Soda didn't even last a year on the shelves. And the marketing company that was in charge of the ad campaign, they even admitted they were going for what the soda should feel like and not what the soda should taste like. It's a lot of soda talk, but I need to set all this up because back in the early 80s, late 70s, video games were just starting to become a thing. So how do you describe what a video game is like to somebody who has never ever touched a video game in their lives? Especially when the graphics suck as much as they did back then. Well, you do some stuff that's probably going to feel kind of familiar to modern gamers. I'd like an Atari 2600 system, please, and everything that goes with everything. You sure want everything? I want everything. Now you get well, for starters, the console has to sell confidence. Consumers have to be reassured that the console's not just a one-trick pony. There's lots of games, lots of peripherals, and they're going to keep on getting new games down the road. And the message was, this is not a fad, it's worth your money to buy in. Although I, for one, never saw the Atari 2600 computer keyboard anywhere, so yeah, unkept promises started at the very beginning. They also sold the graphics. Which of these games is the closest thing to the real thing? A, in television Major League Baseball, B, Atari Baseball. Okay, I mean, we look at these now and we say, are you kidding me? But at the time, interestingly enough, most games didn't show a lot of game footage, but they would show actors playing it out in real life. Pitfold by Activision. Quick! The Atari video computer system. Or going to the old standard of just selling a feeling. Oh, that's it! That's it! It happened just like that! There's a ship that took me in! And showing only limited gameplay. Also, novelty sold well too. I also remember several handheld games that were trying to sell themselves as the real arcade experience. The official tabletop version of the arcade game. Played the same. Yeah, you want to know what this was? It was a glorified Game & Watch and it sucked battery life. They didn't even show the screen in their ads. Okay, and the big consoles, they had their gimmicks too. And here's new Space Spartans for the Intellivoice module. Hello, Commander. Space One, under attack. But mostly they sold the feeling, because in television they were marketing themselves to be the choice of smart, intelligent people. They went as far as to even hire a British actor to be their spokesman, because, you know, British people are more intelligent than Americans. Uh, moving on. Well, let's fast forward to the NES. Nintendo changed things up a little bit once they had a mascot they could use. 
this was kind of a game changer. Okay, granted, the concept is not anything new, but it was applied to a video game for the first time, and now the mascot could not only sell the console, but they could sell the games and other items. Okay, I'm wandering into I Donut Donut territory here, but it's a thing, it's branding. This also led to the infomercial shows, too. Uh, to sum the things up very briefly, to, they used to make a 30-minute cartoon show that the stations would buy, and then they would fill that cartoon show with commercials for show-related toys, and then boom, you have a 30-minute infomercial for Silverhawks. Or He-Man, She-Ra, Spiral Zone, G.I. Joe, Thundercats, Brave Star, Gem, Mask. It was really bad in the 80s. It was so bad, the Children's Television Act was enacted in 1990 to stop it. Uh, a quick sidebar here. One of my previous jobs, I worked at something called Master Control at a Fox affiliate station. And Master Control, it's basically, um, it's like being a DJ, but with beta tape. Most of you won't know what beta tape is, but that's okay. Um, so one of my jobs every day was I had to watch kids commercials and what I was doing is I was watching for branding so and oftentimes if there was a kid in the background and he was wearing a Digimon shirt you could not run that ad during Digimon it was just that was just a law okay that's all fine and dandy well at the time that I was working there they had a show called Big Guy and Rusty and it's a show about a small robot with a Pinocchio complex and then uh, during the show on the network side of things they ran an ad from Nike called Pinocchio I don't even want to contemplate how high the fine was. But in the 80s, all bets were off. Video games, they, they, they took notice of the 30 minute infomercials. Okay, you could argue that this isn't advertising because it had characters of all over the board, but I would chalk it up as advertising. If anything else, it's increasing brand recognition. That and I get to use this. Do the Mario swing your arms. Fast forward a generation or two and ads for the games kept on showing real life actors either performing or trying to be hip and cool with the game stuff. And I think that this is the game because the game makers they knew that the graphics wouldn't hold up the television. Well, that and gaming was still kind of novel at the time. It was at least it was just seen as like a kid thing, say for Saturday morning cartoons only. Well, it now, most of the ads were like this. They were showing minimal in-game footage and opting for actors or showing stuff like the Dreamcast pre-rendered cast. And you're, again, they're selling a feeling or a mood. You know, play our game, be cool and awesome. But a lot of the stuff in the 90s, yeah, you don't really get an idea what the game is. Gamers already play something like a fighting game. Yeah, they get what this is all about. But for most people, most of the time, they just don't. Also, of interest, yeah, the consoles. Sega hit it off with their own mascot, and they went after Nintendo hardcore. And Sega's ads, they were really hammering the speed of the processor, the graphic capability, and they were marketing itself for hardcore gamers. It's free. What Nintendo? And it worked. But I remember watching these ads even at the time, and I was just thinking they were trying too hard to be edgy. But I'm not the target demo, so there you are. I also remember that the PlayStation ads, they were trying so hard to make Crash Bandicoot the mascot that Mario was, and they went even as far as to go the Sega route of attacking Nintendo. Hey, plumber boy, mustache man, your worst nightmare has arrived. Yeah, Crash Bandicoot was a successful game series, no doubting that, but the mascot status, that didn't take. I mean, hell, they tried Spyro and Lara Croft for a while too, but no dice. Actually, I think the PlayStation has done better for itself by not having a mascot. It allows us to focus more on the games itself. Kind of like Sega was originally, you know. You know, actually, I think what's happening is that there's less emphasis on the consoles and more emphasis on the games. But they're still using the same old tricks. Oh, such a perfect day. Yeah, you still see ads for consoles, but not as much as like the game franchises. And I guess the thinking has shifted to, well, if you're going to buy the game, then you're obviously going to buy the console. And the ads for the consoles, you might not think of them as ads, because what we get are hour-long infomercials. E3, PAX, other trade shows, and we end up watching them on YouTube. Okay, on this one, how many millions of dollars were spent on that set? Getting everyone there, the lighting, the production, all of it to hype people up for the X-Bone. And all of it demolished when Sony had this one sentence. PlayStation 4 won't impose any new restrictions on the use of PS4 games. And what's funny is that when you watch these things, you see echoes of the old days of the Atari and television console war. They're trying to sell confidence. You know, we got lots of games. They're selling the versatility. Well, you can watch movies on our system. They're promising peripherals and expansions, or simply, this isn't a fad, it's worth sinking your money in. So has advertising for the games really changed? Yes and no. 
Out are the actors and in are pre-rendered cutscenes and simulated game footage. Next time you're watching an ad for a video game, look for the fine print way at the bottom of the screen. They have to include that now. And also ask yourself when you're watching that ad, do I actually learn anything about this game or are they just selling me a feeling again? In the Halloween episode, I touched on Spec Ops The Line, but hell, let's just dive right into that. It's a game that was more of a horror game in the pure sense of the term. You know, it's more like an art game, and it was going after the players for doing what you're supposed to do in a dark brown shooter genre, thereby making commentary in the dark brown shooter genre. But the ads didn't sell it as such. They all sell it as a dark brown shooter clone, and people were angry at this, and the backlash was strong, and it wasn't out of nowhere. Watch the original ads for the game, and there is no indication of what the game really was. There is a line men like us have to cross. Okay, if you played through the game, that line of dialogue might give you a clue that it's coming, but it wouldn't have been out of place out of a Call of Duty trailer. In hindsight, yeah, the game was making a point, but doing so at $75 a pop to players who didn't want to get chastised for gaming the way that they always gamed? It was masquerading as a shooter clone to sell units, and the artsy make the player feel bad angle was a, was that was a swerve, and we didn't pay for that. It's like going to watch Alien vs. Predator, and in the second half, the movie turns into the seventh seal. Hmm. Incidentally, isn't somebody going after Hello Games for false advertising? Just just kind of curious. A little bit. Yeah. Actually, I think that's going to be the new face of advertising now. It's going to be the two to three year hype cycle. Pre-order rant aside, the new model for advertising seems to be less about TV-style commercials and more about the live dev promises. No Man's Sky, they actually sold their game perfectly. They sent out one guy, and he kept a consistent message to all the talk shows, media outlets, and so on, and the internet pretty much did the rest. People bit the bait, and they spread the message for them. Now, you're still going to see TV ads for some games, probably mostly mobile platforms and so-called free-to-play titles, and this isn't going to go away anytime soon, because those games are very profitable. All they need to do is get people to try it, just for a little while, because most people won't see the Skinner box lid until it's sealed over their heads, and millions of non-gamers have no clue that games do this. But for console games, I think the TV-style commercials and online trailers, yeah, we're going to see almost exclusively cutscene movie-style trailers from here on out. You remember the Gears of War ad with the sad piano bit? Think like that, but fully dependent on what music rights they can get, and it's going to be high action sequences with select dialogue that may or may not actually tell you what the hell's going on. And most of these commercials rely on you already being a loyal customer and knowing pretty much everything that's going to be happening in the first place. So, to give you an idea of this, the next time you're watching an Assassin's Creed trailer, I want you to think about this. If I've never played anything within the franchise before, would I have a single clue what the hell's going on in this game? And the answer to that is probably going to be no. So what that tells me is that there's not going to be anything new or interesting in the next foreseeable future. Because, I mean, wh why try to explain something brand spanking new when people are willing to buy the same old thing over and over again? Wow, I've gotten really super jaded. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, give it a thumbs up, because that helps us out a lot. You can also subscribe to the channel absolutely free. You can check out one of the playlists below or a related show if you want to binge watch. And if you really like us, you can support us on Patreon. Thank you once again. Actually, there's one addendum that I wanted to add, but it really didn't fit into the main show because, well, well ColecoVision. It was a video game system years ahead of the Atari and Nintendo television at the time. It had an arcade level graphics, it had a lot of titles, it was expandable, they had all the right things and all the right ads. It's simple. You can play Atari 2600 cartridges on ColecoVision, but you can't play ColecoVision on Atari. So why isn't there a huge nostalgia factor? The Atom computer. And only ColecoVision plugs into the Atom module to become the complete Atom computer system. Yeah, you, you could legit turn the console into a computer with 80 kilobytes of RAM, cassette, tapes, drive storage, and... Yeah, it was buggy as all hell, it was not EMP shielded, it was a mess. It basically it tanked Coleco and it killed the game system. So yeah, the advertising worked, just the hardware didn't work. So, yeah. All the advertising in the world is not going to protect you from yourself sometimes.